I thought we should come outside for the teleological argument because it's all to do with nature. And we'll go through some of the key players in this argument, but we should mention that its basic form is, of course, inductive. It appeals to probability. In later versions of the argument, from, say, Tennant, it takes a bit of a, a looser um, appeal to probability and takes on the form of an abductive argument, but we'll get on to that. So let's start with Aquinas. Aquinas' fifth way, as you remember, uses the analogy of an archer. As an arrow is directed towards its target by an archer, so it seems that we cannot have things directed to a final cause, essentially without some sort of designer since the arrow cannot itself fly towards its target but requires an archer so things that are designed require a designer so let's go to the very start of the 19th century in 1802 where Paley presents to us his famous analogy of crossing a heath and pitching your foot against a stone and in crossing a heath Suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be, I might possibly answer that for anything I knew. To the contrary, it had lain there forever, nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. But suppose I had found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place, I should hardly think of the answer which I had given before. For anything I knew, the watch might have always been there. So, the difference between the watch and the stone is that the watch obviously evinces design. It is no natural object. And I don't need to have any experience of, of watches to know that. And if it has, upon inspection, some design, because things work together well, that is, uh, it appears to be regular. So qua regularity is one of the um, epithets given to this form of the argument. Then it seems improbable that this would have come about by chance and then qua purpose for some end it seems upon inspection that the watch is able to tell the time and so it must have had someone to have designed it to tell the time and he then draws in this analogy between the watch and the world and says well look everything in the world fits together for some order of course he's drawing on the sort of 18th century model of the world through Newtonian physics, um, which later Poking Horn talks about when he says um, that the universe doesn't have this this order that it's not a um, a divine clockmaker anymore because of the insights of quantum physics. But that's something that you can certainly bring in as some evaluation. Anyway, given according to Paley that the world is ordered that it is fit for all kinds of life it seems the most probable thing is that it has been designed to that end and furthermore we can infer certain things about the designer so looking at the watch we can infer intelligence and so forth and we can infer intelligence and goodness of the deity because this world is lovely and it supports life so it suggests a benevolent and powerful uh, designer. His second analogy is from the telescope and the eye and essentially he just compares the two and says look they are similar, they have uh, similar features, they have lenses, it's enabled sight and we know that the one has been designed and it would be very strange um, given the similarity if the other hadn't also been designed. Now at the moment this sort of seemed to hold weight, it was the most probable explanation However, of course, David Hume, writing actually before um, Paley, and, and you should remember that, um, it's just that we, we look at the argument in its positive form first before really addressing its, its weaknesses. So, as you remember, um, Hume has elsewhere said, well, you know, just because something evinces design doesn't mean it has been designed. He draws an analogy with um, the building of a house, and he says, look, we know that men build houses, and so if we look at a house, we infer that they've been built by human beings. But we have no experience of 
worlds being built, and worlds being designed, and say, therefore, it's not fair to infer that they have been designed. What's more, many men work together to build a house, and the more people that you have working on a project, the less skilled they need to be. They can have specific skills, but they wouldn't need to have all the skills. So in building a house, you have an electrician, you have a plasterer, you have plumbers, you have the architects, you have the bricklayers, etc, etc. So why not posit many gods? Why just the one god? This argument, says Hume, essentially doesn't do anything to demonstrate the probability, much less prove, the existence of a single deity. We might say, in response to that, that okay, fine, the actual um, world builders, um, the mechanics, if you like, of the system uh, might be in several number, but they have to work to a single plan, say, the architect's plan. Another objection that Hume raises is that, for all we know, this might be the first rude essay of some infant deity. He says, many worlds might have been botched and bungled throughout an eternity, ere this system was struck out, much labour lost, many fruitless trials made, and a slow but continual improvement carried on during infinite ages in the art of world-making. So, how do we know that the deity has any particular intelligence and haven't just tried and tried and tried? And finally, and then just now, come to this thing. Now, John Stuart Mill's criticism of the argument is perhaps a little bit more subtle and nuanced than even Hume's. He is, of course, writing a bit later and, in fact, in 1874, is able, therefore, to directly criticise Paley. He says, Paley's illustration of a watch puts the case much too strongly. If I found a watch on an apparently desolate island, I should indeed infer that it had been left there by human beings. But the inference would not be made for marks of design, but because I already know by direct experience that watches are made by men. So far this sounds just like Hume's uh, criticism, but the difference is that Mill is very careful to draw a distinction between inferring by analogy. So A looks like B, A has a particular cause, B therefore also has a particular cause, and inference through induction. And induction, he says, is only legitimized by past experience. Now, you remember his ethical framework, and he says that mankind have been learning from experience the tendency of certain actions to promote happiness or unhappiness, which is why, of course, all men do not go out upon the sea of life um, starting from scratch. But in fact, the direct quotation would be, all men go out upon the sea of life with their minds made up on the common questions of right and wrong. So there's a nice link to ethics there and his whole um, sort of relationship, if you like, with induction as being a good or at least a fairly sound way of arriving at conclusion. And so actually what Mill ends up conceding is that um, uh, there is a legitimate inductive inference, namely we are warranted by the canons of induction in concluding that what brought all these elements, he's talking about the eye here, together was some common cause to all. And in as much as the elements agree in the single circumstance of conspiring to produce sight, there must be some connection by way of causation between the cause which brought those elements together and the fact of sight. And so this is rather the point that up until we have um, any alternative theory, it seems likely that we have to explain how it is that eyes have conspired to enable us to see. However, he has a bit of a moral criticism, and it is simply this, that nature is, as Tennyson would say in In Memoriam, red in tooth and claw. Why is it that animals have to tear each other apart? It doesn't seem loving. So if there is a designer, he may not be all that benevolent. And therefore, there's no ground, he says, in natural theology for attributing intelligence or personality to the obstacles which partly thwart what seems the purpose of the Creator. Now, up until this point, the debate has been as to whether the argument fails logically to demonstrate the existence of God. 
and you may think that the criticisms are strong and that we don't have good reason to infer the existence of a designer from the seemingness of the world being designed. But we're still left with the question, well, how is it that we've developed eyes? How is it that things conspire together to support human life and so forth? Remember, that's the anthropic principle, the idea that the universe is able to support human life and seems therefore to be designed in that way and we'll get on to um, how Pokinghorn reframes that a bit later. In this regard I think Dawkins is absolutely right to say that it wasn't until Darwin came along that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually satisfied atheist. The question is answered by some other mechanism than oh it had to have been a designer. And that's why, of course, Pokinghorn will say that um, Darwin came and pulled the rug out from under Paley's feet. Now let's examine the argument from probability, because the anthropic principle suggests that it's so unlikely that a world would just spontaneously or even gradually develop such that uh, it's able to support human life. It must have been designed for this. And Pokinghorn uses the analogy of cosmic knobs. So he says, imagine lots of dials um, and many, many settings. If you spin dials, it may land on a, a setting which is able to sort of support life. But actually, the conditions required to support human rational, that is to say life, are so precise that no amount of random spinning would probably land in them. It seems rather that they have to be finely tuned. And so he talked about the fine tuning of the cosmic knobs was necessary to make men. Now, this is where, of course, Dawkins' work on probability comes in. And he uses a couple of different analogies. One is the Boeing 747. So if you were to dissemble a, a plane, I mean, it's probably not too easy, too difficult to do that now, as they're all grounded due to COVID-19. but Let's suppose that you're able to break into a hangar and you dissemble um, this plane and, and leave all the bits out. Those, that collection of, of metal is no less and no more remarkable than the same material, the same bits of metal, in the arrangement that make the Boeing 47, 747, that, that make it able to fly. It's only that that one particular um, shape or form, to your, use Aristotle's terminology, enables us to fly. He uses uh, another example. So if um, you imagine uh, monkeys sitting and typing out randomly on typewriters, eventually they would, if given infinite amount of time, infinite monkeys, type the complete works of Shakespeare. But any particular combination that they spell out is no less and no more probable than any other combination. It's only that the lines to be or not to be are significant to us, that we think of them as therefore having to be designed. One further example is um, pebbles on a beach. So if from the air you see some white stones laid out on a beach and they spell the word welcome, it's no less and no more probable than any other arrangement if I threw stones at a beach enough times. It could spell out all kinds of messages. It's only that we recognise the letters or that arrangement, that pattern, as being significant to us in um, communicating a message that we infer design and think it's more likely to have been designed. So this appeal to probability is itself not a very good case. However, because when we don't have any certainty about something, we can only kind of go with probability, it did seem, until there was an alternative explanation, that Paley had more or less of a point. If you couldn't explain it by some designer, what else was the candidate? There seemed to be nothing more probable. This is where, of course, intelligent design comes in and irreducible complexity. As we remember, something is said to be irreducibly complex if there's no way that it could have uh, come about gradually. 
So, the human eye is thought, or was thought, to be irreducibly complex, because if you try and alter it slightly, it doesn't work. But, as Dawkins points out, there are many different kinds of eyes. So some, the eyes of some mammals uh, are unable to see all of the visible light spectrum. Our eyes can't see ultraviolet light um, or infrared, etc. Uh, and so there's not really a problem if you uh, think of the journey towards the eye as something like uh, a traveller going up a, the, the slope of a mountain what Dawkins calls Mount Improbable, instead of trying to jump from its base to the top. That is a very improbable leap, going from zero to the top in a single bound. That would require some intelligent design. But if you go round the mountain and gradually ascend, gradually climb up, it isn't any more um, improbable. And so, the theory of natural selection, the theory of sexual selection, which is to say, obviously, Darwin's um, what becomes the theory of evolution, seems to render as needless Paley's appeal to the probability of a designer from the appearance of design. It's at this point that Tennant takes up the mantle in 1930, and having the benefit of having been able to read Darwin and reply to all those objections, he points out a couple of things. He says that actually gradualness of design wasn't the, the problem um, with the, the theory. It is, of course, just this alternative explanation. But, he asks, why do things progress? And therefore, he says, survival of the fittest presupposes the arrival of the fit. In other words, evolution seems to be directed towards some goal, and why should that be the case? Furthermore, he says, for Darwin, the random mutations that occur that enable this process of adaption, adaptation and improvement, in short, evolution, is taken by Darwin merely as a datum. He accounts for it, it's axiomatic, of course, to his theory. Without these random mutations that occur in species, there wouldn't be any evolution. But he can't account for the random mutations. And essentially, Tennant just says, room is left. Room is still left for God. Now, you might say this is another God of the gaps argument, and perhaps it is. But it does show that the gaps haven't gone away. They've just become sort of different gaps. What's really clever, though, about Tennant is that he says, OK, so we can't anymore appeal to mere probability, a logical probability. We have to take a bit of a step back and appeal to abduction and chains of reasoning. And so this is yeah, what we call abductive reasoning. You might remember Basil Mitchell's parable of the ship approaching land. Uh, the lookout sees maybe something that looks like clouds it may look like land it's ambiguous he says i think we're approaching land but the navigator says no no i think you're wrong um according to my calculations we're we're miles away from land fine but then he sees another cloud looking like land or land looking like cloud and another and another maybe there's a seagull and so all of these little bits of evidence taken singly aren't very conclusive, don't even amount to a probability, but when added together, make the argument seem more forcible. And Tennant thus offers us the aesthetic argument as a special kind of argument for the existence of God from uh, an inspection of the world. And it's simply this, nature is saturated with beauty. Just look around us. Okay, the sky isn't particularly blue today, but, and, and also my garden doesn't have many flowers in because I'm kind of lazy and also not very good at gardening. Um, but essentially, from the starry heavens to the silicious skeleton of the diatom, nature is saturated in beauty, he says. Whereas man's outputs, by comparison, are generally vile. Why should there be so much beauty? 
Now, we can't account for beauty by an appeal to Darwinism. Sexual selection is, of course, an important part of the evolutionary process. So we can say why peacocks have uh, pretty feathers to attract a mate, etc. But this doesn't account for the saturation of beauty. It doesn't account for why we find the stars, the sunsets to be beautiful, unless you really want to go down to some sort of spurious route of, well, sunsets are beautiful so that ugly men or weak men or women can write poems about the sunsets to woo their mates. I mean, that's a bit of a stretch. Of course, John Keating, the teacher in Dead Poets Society, might agree with you when he says that poetry was written with one goal, to woo women. But frankly, I think that's kind of stretching it a little bit. And so there seems to be no survival value for beauty. Let's not get confused with the fact that we find different things to be beautiful. That's merely the subjective opinion of what is beautiful, not the fact that, according to him, um, nature evokes aesthetic sentiment. So we might have differences of opinion about whether um, a Monet is beautiful or whether a Van Gogh is aesthetically pleasing. But we don't argue that we feel a sense of beauty and awe. And this, this beauty is much more than merely... Uh, some sort of sexual attraction. So, given the fact of beauty as uh, a judgment and a feeling, this needs to be accounted for and added to all the other things, Tennant says, it might seem that if we speak of a purpose of beauty, it might seem to be a purpose of God for man. So, in summary, we have Aquinas, who foreshadows, of course, the point made by Paley. Pale, Paley appeals to two analogies, the watch and the telescope. This is shot down by Hume and by Mill. Mill's point is a bit more subtle because he makes the point that um, it appeals to analogy of poor and it's really about induction, but we can't induce from the world because we haven't got experience of worlds being made. Also there's a problem with uh, inferring the beneficence of the deity because nature is better in tooth and claw and it all seems a bit rubbish so bringing the problem of evil there. Um, we then use Darwin to pull the rug from under Paley's feet and propose an alternative hypothesis which seems to render the whole argument uh, pointless if not um, untrue. Tennant tries to rescue this by saying, well, yes, but we've got to explain the purpose of evolution in the first place. And also there are these other things that require explanation. If we add them all together, it seems to make the argument a bit more convincing. So, teleological arguments for God. Happy revision. Happy revision. See you later.